spiritual aspects of Agnihotra. Last time we covered the three Archman mantras as well as so I had some preliminary discussion on Angisparsh mantra where I was indicating that there seems to be no guidance about the sequence of them starting from Vang me ase astu, then naso me prano astu. I think the one simple logical possibility is it is just the physical proximity. So, you know, if I am touching my mouth and I go upward, then the next is nose then the eyes, then the ears, and then I come to my arms, shoulders, and then the thighs and knees, etc. So it could be just very well be the physical proximity of that has determined this particular sequence. I already made a remark, the in, for instance, about Karn being an outer organ for the sensory organ, but Shrote is where the input signals are passed on to the mind domain. In our understanding, Vedic understanding, mind is very minute, it is made of matter but it is not to be confused with our brain. Mind is a, a very tiny, subtle domain surrounding myself, my soul, which is non-physical. So naturally, the mind domain provides the connectivity between the gross body that is made of matter on the, the one side and on the other side, it is the non-physical consciousness, which is a singularity, a point like. That is what is said, Vayu anilam ammetam etadam basmantam shayiyam. So these are two very different entities, the body, the shayi which has an ant, the end, and then it is a handful of ash, basmantam shayir. And on the other hand, my consciousness is vayu anilam ammetam. Ammet is undying, which never dies, because it is very forceful, vayu anilam, because it is non-material. So these are two very diverse entities, the me consciousness and my gross outer body domain. Naturally, the connectivity is provided by the mind domain that has intermediate characteristics, intermediate in the sense it is made of matter, but very subatomic particles and it is very minute so that at the other end it is connecting to the consciousness purush what is called and that connectivity is what is called bandha bondage you know so within the mind now there is a, the closest to me the purush is buddhi then ahanka and then manas now, buddhi and at the level of buddhi and purush, that knot that has tied them together is called hither ganti. And, uh, you know, in moksha, my attempt is to open it out so that 
that bondage is no more there. Anyway, so the point I was trying to make is within the mind that is an aggregate of buddhi and ahankar and then manas. Now manas has five inlet ports coming from five sensory organs and also has five outlet ports for the motor organs. Now inner ports, the incoming sensory organs Sankhya, Kapil, authored by Kapil, he is saying it is Kamasha, it is one at a time. So the Manas is uh, picking up data signal from five inlet ports in a sequential manner, one at a time, Kamasha. While the Manas is, has the ability to activate the outlet ports that take him to motor organs in uh, with multiplicity. So Sankhya term is a kamasha. That doesn't have to be one at a time. That is what we are familiar with multitasking. So I can, I am walking and as I walk, through my hands, I can take out something from my pocket and I can also speak to my co-passenger, somebody with whom, uh, with whom I am walking. So, you know, I can speak, do something, manipulation with hands and walk as well. So all this can happen simultaneously. But when it comes to seeing and hearing, or for that matter, other three sensory organs, I do one at a time. But of course, in day-to-day -day life, we see that as if you are seeing me and hearing me at the same time. That appearance happens because the manas is picking up data signal from sight and sound organ one at a time, but in very rapid succession. It happens at a very, very high speed, maybe speed of light or even beyond that. So it gives an appearance that I am seeing and hearing the speaker at the same time, but it is one at a time. Okay, so what I was saying was, Kern is the outer ear organ, what is called in the Golak, whereas the Shota is that inlet port where the hearing signals are transferred to the inner domain of mind and that particular linkage is called Manas. And then it passes on to Ahankar where a copy is made for future reference that is what is our memory storage device for all the all the knowledge, all the all the past knowledge, past experience, and past actions also. So all the past is stored as if their impatience are lying there. And then the data signal is further projected on my buddhi. Where I so that um, not the Purush and Buddhi have been tied together is very peculiar in the sense that consciousness, as if it has lent some consciousness to Buddhi. And it is both way, the image that is falling on Buddhi is somehow known by Purush, what Vyas calls Buddhi Pati Samvedi. So as if, you know, they give an example of a crystal glass that a yellow color flower, if it is brought near to that crystal glass, that appears to become yellow. And if it is red color, it appears, though it doesn't change by itself. So Purush doesn't go through any change whatsoever. It remains what is called Nithi Shuddha Buddha Mukta 
but being buddhi pati samvedi it just gets to know whatever is appearing on buddhi so that is buddhi vetti and then just to close the picture if you if the particular purush embraces that buddhi vetti you know then it becomes his bhog vetti so that is not automated if he is if he is propelled by vayagya then that buddhi vetti doesn't become bhog vetti if he has been guided by klesh in our life particularly rag and dvesh then that buddhi vetti will become bhog vetti and now the bhog that he is doing say he enjoys a cup of coffee then that taste is also remembered is stored in our own car and suppose he wants an additional cup of coffee then he gives a command to buddhi now buddhi passes it on to ahankar and then manas but ahankar now stores the bhog vetti that yes i like that particular coffee and also it stores the impatience of action like i might be walking back to the kitchen to fill up my cup again so those actions are also remembered so you know so past knowledge is called smriti past experience bhog is called as vasna and past repetitive actions that you do is called sanskar but this whole family of smriti vasna sanskar is also referred to by the word sanskar so depending on the context sanskar may mean only past impressions of your past actions or it may mean all the content in the ahankar unit so anyway we have taken the opportunity to briefly look at how our mind so when we say mind or antakarna we mean the aggregate of buddhi ahankar and manas of course the context here was karna and shotham so karna is outer ear organs and the shot is that where the data is being transferred that was received from hearing signal and is now being passed on to manas at that particular inlet port is shot and uh, then how the indicators of mind function so we have discussed even last time this uh, the beauty of all these functioning like we looked at even though there are two eyes but the image is very sharp focused and even though we have two ears outer ears but uh, the the words that we hear the sound that we hear is very precise as if it is there is no blurred thing there and also we noticed that the ear ears our outer hearing organs are slightly distant from each other not much about say 20 30 cm or whatever it is but our hearing those longitudinal acoustic waves that are coming towards us we are able to differentiate that slight difference in time that one ear heard before the second the other one and then even if my eyes are closed i can make out that probably the sound came from this direction and not this direction so you know all these are wonderful designs of that supreme consciousness and we are all blessed with all this these are very very complex systems that we are blessed with the both body and mind well having said all this about mind in from vedic philosophers point of view 
the me, my consciousness, and my mind enters in entered into this particular body when I was conceived by my mother, and when I die, again my consciousness enveloped by this most aggregate of mind, the antakaran, will depart from this body. So you know we are familiar with the. Uh, Jesuve 34 chapters, first six mantras ending with Tanme Mana Shiv Sankalp Masti. At two occasions it says Yen Ammetin and Ammetam. So even the mind has been characterized as undying. Of course, not as strictly as our soul is, which is non physical, but it is also undying in the sense. It is the same mind I carry forward, birth after death and birth after death after this cyclic. And this is my personal position until I get moksha. So this is another peculiar aspect of Vedic psychology. The mind is with me. It was with me before my birth and it will remain with me after death and it is the kind of uh, carrier to all the data that I have. So I have, I was born with all the sanskars of past hundreds, thousands of life and I will continue to gain all this, build up more and more. And uh, this is also to say is my passbook, bank passbook, where all the entries are made. And uh, he's that supreme being is my banker. And this is my account of leisure, where everything is entered into it. Particularly if I am driven by rag and dvesh. If I am going by vayagya, then the uh, buddhi vetti is not becoming bhog vetti and then this doesn't build up its own karma shay. then that related actions karma are uh, not entered into that leisure so you know for moksha i have to develop vayagya so that there is no new entity in this data uh, leisure book and also I have to practice deep meditation so that the old antis that are called as clash that I was born with are burnt out, you know, what what is called. So in very deep in Samadhi, the clash that gave rise to my current birth and anything that I might have subsequently made in the present life are uh, burnt out. So there is a twofold strategy to develop Vayagya and do practice of that Samadhi is called Abhyas. So Abhyas and Vayagya will drive me to that point. Anyway, the context was the two words, Karn and Shotha, and I briefly utilized it to discuss the depth, the details of our mind without going much into detail, following Kapil's Sankhya Sutta. And as I said last week, I was just posing a question about the sequence. So today I have just remarked that the sequence could be as simple as that. Yeah, simple physical proximity. Okay, so one more aspect probably. Uh, water can clean the body and uh, from both externally as well as internally, we are aware of this fact. We take baths, shower with water and we drink a lot of water to wash away toxins from the inner body. But as we are discussing spiritual aspects here, and we have discussed 
the sensory organs as well as motor organs. Both the organs and not only they, as they are depicted on the outer body, even their far end, they are at their inlet and outlet ports for the mind. So we have discussed all that. So there is an implicit understanding here, and as we remarked last week, that water is not just this physical water. This has a name, Appa, and Appa is that supreme being also that is all pervading. So I am not just touching water on different parts of the body. I can, I am visualizing that all pervading force and its ability to cleanse my body and mind organs. So, you know, though I am touching only with the wet fingers, the outer body organ, I see the power of that upper that it can cleanse my organs, sensory organs and motor organs and they are driven by my mind. So when I say somebody's sight organ or you know say I saw a young beautiful woman with a bad intention in with a sense of lust then it is not that my outer eyes or even that sight signal that <coughs> what is called Akshna <coughs> Chakshu organ. They are made of matter. That is like a desk. You can say it is clean or not clean. You don't say it is pure or impure. Anything made of matter is either clean or not so clean. But physical things don't become pure or impure. Purity is in our thoughts. And thoughts are born on our buddhi from the sanskar that are deposits in our ahankar. So this is all the aggregate is my mind. So when I am saying, may all these organs be pure and this Hindi word is very interesting probably I remarked last time margin you know even in common Hindi we may say we wash our clothes kapde dhona but when it comes to our cooking vessels we don't say bhatan dhona bhatan manjana so that manjana is coming from this margin, which has a, you know, we want uh, cooking vessels to be pure in the sense, you know, slightly more cleaning than the clothes. Clothes will just cover our body, but what will be cooked, the food that we'll cook will go inside our body. So we want a higher level of cleaning when it comes to our cooking vessels or even our plates and bowls and spoons or all these kind of things that we use to eat food. So cooked food or eating food is using certain cockake, all kinds of vessels, instruments, all they have to be clean at a higher level than clothes probably. So that is what is, I am touching the body organs, but the word is margin, highlighting an extra layer of cleaning. And as I said, cleaning here is like I might be seeing a young woman with a negative, impure intentions. So that impurity is 
to be moved. And that is indicated by the word margin. So impurity is removed at my, which is residing in my mind, what Patanjali calls Ashuddhi. So, you know, in Kiya Yoga, he is talking about Klesh. Kiya Yoga is Klesh Tanukarna Atharicha. Klesh is to be diminished. But then when he goes to Ashtang Yoga, then he is using Ashuddhi. Because now the person is not always nice person. Of course, the average person is also worldly person. He is going after bhog, he wants to, but he believes in good karma. Good karma will bring sukh to him and he is going by the law of the land and functioning properly, not harming anybody. But then there is a blue average person whose clash has become a shuddhi. And then Patanjali's prescription is Ashtang Yoga for this third level person. You know. And then he is using the word Ashuddhi. And then he is, his prescription includes Yam and Niyam, Moral Code of Conduct. So that Ashuddhi is removed, to be removed that only Ishwa can do. And that happens when I go in meditation. So that is why we emphasize everybody to do meditation because that purifies your mind. So here there is a idea that that Apah Devi, that Supreme Consciousness is not just mere this physical water, but that upper, if I use his power to the fullest extent, beyond just cleansing myself with water, if I go next step, then he can do Vishwani, Dvitani, Payashua, Yad Baddhamar. He can remove all the negativities, impurities from my mind. If I go in meditation and disconnect from my mind, as if I have handed it over my mind to him when I am disengaged from mind. And then he is as if washing and servicing my mind. So these are also ideas that are indicative here when I look at, because we are not taking shower here. We are just, everything is symbolic here. Even here, I don't drink a glass of water. I just take three sips of water. So it is symbolic here to give me, a, to get a message. Okay, let's move on. So we have covered now the Archman and uh, Angus Parsh. Now we are told Samidha Chayan Vedi Mekaya. No, this is Sanskar Vedi. And I am looking at the what is called the Samanya Prakaran, as the title is here, Samanya Prakaran. So Sanskar Vidhi describes the very routine Agni Hotel, and in its later chapters it adds on all that is required in a particular Sanskar. So, you know, the reason I am this pointing out is Usually you will see most of the people, by this time they have put the Samidha in the Havan Kund. Actually it should be done at this occasion. So strictly speaking, after the Archman, Ishwa Istuti Pratma Pasna, you know, some people do Archman before Ishwa Istuti Pratma. Whatever it is, the point is just before this Agni Adhyan, Om Bhurbhuas. Just before this, Samidha should be put in the, should be placed into the Havan Kund. Not much in advance. So this is what I um, thought I should point out. Because generally I have seen people 
put it in much in advance. Okay. Nothing much here to say. Maybe I can. This is Vedi. So this is another concept. Maybe we can discuss here. There are certain spiritual aspects are there. So, you know, it is not just mere Havan Kund. So Havan Kund is a, either a vessel or it is which is placed on the floor of the ground or it has been you know one has to dig it out or one can make it permanently in the on the base of the floor when it is made on the base of the floor the outer part of it of course, there are dimensions which are, have been covered in the previous pages by my Siddhartha. So, in very brief, the dimension is it is an square shape. It's any cross section is square. And if the top, if it is a square, say X, then it is, a, it is a, actually like an inverted pyramid that has been chopped off. So if you know an inter a pyramid with four faces, then if you cut it, now where do you cut it? You cut it at a perpendicular height of X, where X is the square at the base, you know. So if you just have to fix up a dimension X, if you're, it is a square pyramid we are talking about, where all the sides are X, and uh, if you imagine a complete pyramid going to its apex, but then you are chopping it off at the height, this is a perpendicular height, that is X. Now you are left with a tiny square, that will be the base of the Havan Kund, and you will see that is x by 4. So that's what we are told. So the top square is x, the bottom square is x by 4, and the perpendicular height is x. Now if this is the Havan Kund, why is the word Vedi here? So there is an outer periphery of that. The outer periphery strictly speaking, has three steps there. So, you know, there is a step one from the ground, then there is step two, then there is step three, and that meets with the top of the, top phase of the square, Havan Kund, which is x by x. So there is a, some sort of a spiritual thinking that why there are three steps, you know. So then there is a, this is, the number three is a great magic number in Vedic philosophy. And uh, it has been principally covered in Kat Upanishad because Kat Upanishad is a dialogue between Nachiketa and Yam. Now Yam is an Acharya, but his name is Yam because Yam is also synonym of death, Mithyu. So as if when a child goes to Acharya, all his uh, negativities are die out and he is enlightened with positive knowledge, as if all the darkness is gone away. So that is one way. So there is a Another nyukti of the word Acharya, Acharya Mithyu, as if he is death personified, so to say. So anyway, he is Yamacharya. So when he reaches, this is, a, of course, is a notional story. He, Yam doesn't appear then and there. 
and this is so to say is swerve lock it is uh, where you go after death really literally so it is a it is a and that's what we'll discuss in the next om bhur bhur swa swa is swa lok what is called swarga swarga the word is a compound word swa added to ga ga is for gaman which also means prapti so swa is as we'll see next swa is supreme happiness pleasure and ga is its you have obtained it so swarg is a place where you have that distinct anand obviously that is within us here so when i disconnect from my mind i am with him and when i am with him i am with i am in swarg so that's what is deep in meditation upasna is called as uske anand swarup mein magn ho jana so that is where i meet him is it not so it's not there is a heaven somewhere up in the sky it is right here so the story goes like when yam uh, nachiketa reaches the door steps of acharya yamacharya then he is asked to wait for three nights so number number 3 comes from there and then when yamachai appears he says okay you are quite a motivated student so you stayed here hungry for three nights waiting for me to learn something was plausibly about death that's why you came to yam and uh, so i give you three boons now so three nights became three boons for him and then he asked three questions his question his boons sorry they were in the form of questions nothing wrong in that so he is first was very practical my father was angry and this and that so may he be cool calm and happy and then he wants to know death what it is and then third is what is beyond death you know so this is a dialogue between them and then this is so getting into magic number 3 so three nights three boons and uh, there is a dialogue in the in answers to nachiketa's question yamacha is saying many things of course with lot of spiritual connotations that it, it surrounds the word agni so agni is a very powerful term in vedic philosophy though in agnihotra we are always tuned to physical fire but we have to look at it from a holistic sense agni yask says agniti bhavati agni what is what propels me ahead you know what is of course if i am in darkness physical darkness i will be guided by a torch light is it not so that torch light is my agni i am following that and uh, when i am engulfed with the darkness of knowledge then i my teacher is my agni in the sense he guides me he gives me the light of knowledge and so on so forth so that is sapuvesham api guru kalenan vacheda the supreme consciousness is our primary source of knowledge so he is also agni so you know 
physical agni is also in multi dimension from the sun and then all kinds of fire even samidha is nothing but it, it has stored some of the solar energy for some temporary purpose so it has the an, an agni of the sun and that is hidden within it and now how does it become appear then there is a lot of interesting discussion in upanishad you need two pieces of wood is it not and then you have to have one against another so there is a action mode now so there is a knowledge that yes the wood contains the agni within it but it doesn't come out by itself of course in today's havan we use a lighter or we use a match stick there is also some friction involved there but this is not pure way to initiate havan because this is you are causing pollution when you use a match stick is it not this is uh, these are some solid chemicals they emit bad odor <laughs> so this is not the way to do it so in classical time or in a classical manner it is produced by having one wood above another so samidha has agni but uh, we have to perform an action jyan and kayam together then agni takes birth and then they will used to out of that spark they will burn some dry grass and capture that agni and then build it up like a fire so that's how they do it even even now if they do classical som yag etc they don't use a matches stick they will develop like this as i have described so yamachari is also describing the all the aspects of agni in physical agni is also there in the sun in the samidha in the produce that is produced by farming all the food food grain that is also storing the energy of the sun and then i have to have some agni in my belly fire in the belly jatharagni so that i can digest that food and then i produce more agni a bit droplet of my blood mixes with the air and as if some sort of chemistry is exothermic reaction is taking place and that blood is going around so that becomes agni for the all the parts of my body to remain alive is it not so physical agni also has various forms and appearances like in modern lights etc everywhere and in power plants and engines and all. so physical fire has a, it is fission fusion you know this uh, on the earth we burn that is called coal and oil and wood etc there is a oxidation process but the sun is not functioning like something is being oxidized that is hydrogen hydrogen radicals they just come together fusion and uh, there are different forms of this physical agni that we see that we are utilize and without agni there is nothing in life so we are looking at agni from physical and uh, other uh, that's what yamachai is telling to nachiketa 
and then he is also making a comment that the purpose of our life is to become agni so to say and i meet that supreme agni then ishwar then i am ananda swarup if i have attained moksha and if i have lived my life in that direction properly successfully then my fourth ashram is sanyas ashram is supposedly a pure ashram and purity is a, another name for agni because agni burns away all the impurities and it makes you pure so that's why a sanyasi has a color all his clothes are color of agni so you have to see physical agni and that supreme agni is that ishwar so and that sanyas ashram is after successful completion of three ashrams bhamchaya grahastha one first so those three steps relate to our journey at the three junction points as if i have to qualify to enter into the next and then i am qualified three steps i have covered now i become like an agni and then i see the top square of havan kund agni kund so these are three steps there so this magic number 3 will come very often in havan mantra also right in the beginning we are seeing it so let's take this first is om bhur bhuva swa so here also there are three steps so looking at from physical plane this is called as loka so in our vedic terminology lok is a word where the common man lives there lok so to say so yajur ved 40th chapter third month the second one is kuvanne ve ka mani ji ji vishesh the third is asuya naam te loka so as i mentioned the kriya yoga and the ashtang yoga patanjali's prescription so ashtang yoga is for third kind of categories of people who are who are not careful and their clash became ashuddhi and they are willing to harm others for their own personal gains is it not so about them they are called as asur asuya naam ke log because they are not in harmony with the universal laws so if you are not in harmony with the universal law or is negation so is the idam so if you are not in that idam you are asur asuya naam te loka then they always even after pratyapi gachanti even after death they don't go to moksha they don't go be with agni forever but they will come pratyapi gachanti to the lok they will come back to this world so we are also in this world so lok is the notionally the layers of the physical world so bhulok is at right the ground level the earth so to say ground zero you can say where we all live that's where we were all born so physical and uh, physical level the next is bhuva that is easy to understand if we look at the third level third is dyu lok so we always talk dyava prithvi so when we discussed 
the dipole. This is a very interesting dipole in Vedic terminology, the Ava Prithvi, the sun and the earth. So presumably, wherever is the habitable earth, that has to be part of a solar system, like with sun. Without sun, there can be no life on the earth. So this becomes a pair. So Bhu is the earth, Swa is representing the Dhu, the Dhu Lok, the sun, and the in-between space is called Bhuva. So on physical plane, Bhu, Bhuva, Swa is the earthly plane, ground level, the space in between that has all kinds of, our scientists tell us, the atmosphere and the stratosphere and ionosphere, etc., etc. That will all be in Bhuva. And Swa is that Suya Lok, Dhu Lok, so to say. Now from spiritual point of view, Bhu is uh, Bhu Satayam, is existence, the visible world that we see. So a common man's world, so to say. In a common man's life, two things are happening, Sukh and Dukh. There are joys of life as well as pains of life. But the average person, as I said, is driven by clash. And he knows that good karma, namely dharma, will bring him sukh and adharm will bring dukh. So he tries his best to be on the path of dharma. But so doing, all the noble karma, they also bring the noble rewards. And to have the taste of the rewards, you have to be born again. So the cycle of birth and death continues for an average person. This is an average person who is going by dharma. Of course, intentionally he never does, does adharma, but unintentionally there will always be some adharma. And that's why there is always some pain in life. But broadly, he is very conscious. He wants to follow the noble path of dharma. But as I said, he puts himself into the cycle of sukha and dukha, dharma and adharm, and that causes rag and dvesh. So these are three pairs. Sukh first is rag and dvesh. That's why I was born with some sanskars from previous life. And Rag and Dvesh drive me towards Dharma and Adharm. Second pair. And Dharma and Adharm cause Sukha and Dukha, which is Buddhi Vritti has allowed, has been allowed to become Bhog Vritti. And that Sukha and Dukha again make their deposits for Vasna. And again, I go for some Sukha and that is driven by Rag. So, Rag Dvesh cause Dharma Dharma, they cause Sukh Dukh, and that Sukh Dukh again come back to Rag and Dvesh. So, that is called Sansar Chakya. So, Sansar Chakya is, is, is explained by Shvetashvata Upanishad and also by Vyas in his commentary to Patanjali's Yogadarsha. Shadaya, as if this is a wheel of six spokes. So I have described Ragdvesh, Dharma Dharma and Sukh Dukh. So this noble person is also in this Sansar Chakya. So that's what, as I remarked in the beginning, to come out of this, you have to become a higher order person. Higher order person is Devta. He gets out of this Dharma Dharma, 
is thus called what is called ashukla and akashna neither adharm nor adharm this is nishkam karm he doesn't go after the rewards of the karm then what is his propelling force driving force he is merely doing because of ko vanne ve karmani ji na karm lipyate na ye without being lipt without being attached to his karma he is merely doing it as if this is what is expected from him by that supreme consciousness of agni so he just does it like a young mother just works hard for the child just for the sake of the child but when you do it for the sake of the entire humanity all the beings then you are a devta of highest category then your karma don't build any karma shall as i said in the beginning they don't enter into your ledger book that is driven by vyagya and then you practice the meditation part like patanjali is teaching that is called abhyas and then you burn away all that so this is what is our ability you know this is what is sansa chakya and this is how one can come out of it. so now there are three levels of people the average that i have given by described below average was one who is willing to do some other consciously for some petty gains of life so he is down slide so this is average nice man and there is positive who is driven by vyagya and then he is qualified to do the abhyas if you are not having vyagya you will not find that your meditation is good because a lot of things will come out from your memory from your ahankar they will keep on disturbing your chit so vyagya is very very necessary to practice in life so bhu is bhu sattayam the time is exceeding now uh, so we will take up this spiritual aspects of bhu bhu aswa next time today we have covered the physical planes of bhu is the earthly plane swa is the sun the dew lord and bhua is in between and next time we will begin with what are the spiritual aspects of these three lok these three words bhu bhua swa thank you very much for your attention we will meet again next week have a good time until then